yeah, thanks a, very, uh, thanks a lot to the organizers and for uh, the very kind invitation. Um, yeah, in industry, we're uh, of course interested in, in the application of alchemical uh, free energy simulations. And uh, um, I have basically two, uh, two chapters uh, in this talk. The first one is basically where we currently are, so what we are currently able to do. The second one is what we would like to do in the future and uh, where we are not currently there yet. Um, <clears throat> so the first part is uh, affinity optimization with relative free energy calculations. I think we have talked about this uh, a lot uh, already. I think everybody knows what it is, so I have not prepared any kind of um, introductory slides. Um, I think there is one aspect regarding relative free energy and, uh, calculations uh, which it has a little bit uh, been underappreciated so far. And that's the complementarity uh, with organic synthesis in, in terms of complexity. Uh, I mean, when we compute certain numbers, uh, of course, it always uh, triggers a decision, should we design a molecule or should we synthesize a molecule or not? Uh, the second aspect which contributes to that decision is how easy it is actually to make this molecule. And, uh, for instance, if you take this kind of molecule here then, uh, and you, you want to optimize it, of course, there is uh, a million ways you can modify these molecules. For instance, uh, if you do kind of modifications here on, the, on this amide side, so the chemists among you will immediately recognize that this is very straightforward chemistry, very easy. Uh, if you have the, the, <coughs> the carboxylic acid here, then you can do parallel synthesis and generate 100 compounds in a day. So it's actually not really worth computing these kind of things. Uh, and, um, on the other hand, uh, if you would like to compute these kind of things, then these are exactly the types of, of uh, transformations which are not always so easy for a, a chemical transformation because depending on what kind of groups you attach on this side, you would deplete a lot of atoms or you have to, have to, have to add a lot of dummy atoms and this is usually the kind of things uh, which are quite challenging for these kind of things. On the other hand, um, you can think of uh, other types of modifications. So for instance, if you shift this nitrogen from here to here, the oxygen one position up, changing methyl to methoxy here, or even uh, change the nitrogen to an oxygen here, introduce different kind of chemical groups here, different stereo centers, uh, or even come up with a different heterocycle and a different aliphatic cycle here. These are all kind of things, uh, it's from a synthetic point of view, it's a nightmare. Because it's uh, simply, um, it's, each molecule here is a different, completely different synthetic route. It's completely uh, independent, no way of parallelization, uh, stereocenters is always very difficult. And so uh, these kind of things are from an experimental point of view are very, very uh, exp uh, expensive. And um, the nice thing about these kind of things is that um, the changes that you actually make to the topology of a molecule and uh, the kind of perturbations, let's say, they are comparably small. Uh, small. And that's uh, why these kind of things usually work quite well uh, in, in uh, these relative free energy calculations. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so um, here is how these uh, chemical free energy calculations work. Uh, in our hands, so this is on a number of representative data sets, public data sets. So for those of you who are uh, interested in the technical details, so we're using Bromax with the gut force field and the PMX uh, that Bert already has described just before the coffee breaks. And we use a uh, non-equilibrium uh, non protocol to use these free energy calculations. So the general observation is um, there are cases where it works pretty well. Um, there are cases uh, which are kind of uh, mediocre, uh, and there are cases uh, where it simply does not work very well. Uh, and um, this is a very general observation that we also observe with other targets. And um, there are many different reasons why why this is the case. Um, we have very few cases where where the atom mapping is a little bit problematic, where you create it's not wrong, but if you create simply a lot of dummy atoms, this is simply something which is not working very well. Um, there is also definitely with the gut force field, there is room for improvement, I think. Um, so there are a lot of dihedral angles which are not very good. Uh, we observed that certain chemical groups, sulfonamides, for instance, we also stumbled over them, or in general, everything. 
which has a sulfur nil proof, um, is, is very likely um, to be uh, not correct. Um, <coughs> but since we talked about uh, a lot about uh, sources of errors, uh, I think um, there is also one source of error which we have not so much talked about yet, and um, this is experimental error. And I've um, collected a couple of examples, so this is not kind of exotic things I was digging for, so it's just uh, kind of things which I stumbled over in my own projects over the last couple of years. So this is a series of compounds measured uh, in an experiment, uh, in an enzyme assay. We always use duplicates to determine the IC50, so this is measured on the same plate. Same day, same experiment, same person doing the experiment in this field. It's a, it's a very good assay, and that's the kind of experimental accuracy which you can expect. So this is a very good experiment. Um, for reasons I do not recall, uh, we measured the same compounds uh, one month later, and you see, again, it's a very, very good um, uh, agreement between the two IC50s, which have been determined at that day. Uh, but then if you compare the numbers which were measured in June from the, to the ones which have me been measured in, in May, then you suddenly see things like that. And uh, uh, it's the identical assay. It was done in the same lab. Uh, it's just one month between the experiments. So nothing has been changed. It was very likely also the same person operating the thing. But nevertheless, there is whatever kind of vari a variability, and nobody knows why. And that's uh, kind, of, uh, kind of an easy assay, so it's not some, something which is very complicated. Um, <clears throat> it can be worse. Um, so this is an example. So what we do very often when we uh, screen for new compounds, we do this in high throughput screening, so highly automated uh, assay systems. And then when we take over the project, uh, we, do, we transfer the, the assay into a different uh, lab um, uh, to support the, uh, it over the course of the project. And uh, so what, what is usually changing is, is uh, the equipment is changing. Sometimes you switch from a 384 well format to a 96 well format. It's a different person usually operating things. But the reagents and all the kind of the assay protocol usually is the same. Uh, and this is a kind of correlation which you get. Uh, and this is also uh, nothing uh, which, which happens uh, rarely or so. This is kind of pretty normal. It's experimental variability. And uh, can be even worse. Um, so these two assays, uh, um, it, it, these are two different types of assays, but they are actually supposed to measure the same thing, which is the inhibition of an ion channel. The one is a so-called flipper assay, which is calcium fluorescence, which is often used for high throughput screening. The other one is uh, electrophysiology, an automated patch clamp, uh, which you cannot use, um, be used for that kind of throughput. And yeah, basically what you see, there is no, no correlation at all uh, between the two assays. And that's simply the reality we are living in. Yeah? So um, whenever you do methods development and, and compare numbers that you have computed with experimental results, I highly recommend that you very carefully look to what kind of experiment uh, you compare your data. Okay, um, that was the first part. Um, the second part um, is what we are um, basically planning for the future and um, uh, what we are heavily uh, pursuing at the moment is, is a kind of a workflow uh, or a finding strategy which, which is called fragment-based drug discovery. I will very briefly in a nutshell explain uh, what, what, what the idea is behind. So you, you screen simply molecules uh, which are much smaller or smaller than the usual drug-like molecules. Uh, this, this is simply because then you assume to have a better sampling of the chemical space which is available. Uh, and in contrast to the uh, other previous assays I showed before, they, the, you have not a functional readout, but you screen with biophysical methods which just uh, look for binding. And in that case, uh, we at least <coughs> use uh, three different biophysical methods, and usually all of these three get a different result. Yeah? And uh, then we usually t take the ones where we have the most confidence in, and then we try to generate an X-ray structure, and that's what we usually get. So you get different uh, fragments binding into the binding sites uh, overlapping, and 
uh, what you usually have, due to the nature that uh, these uh, fragments are very small, is that the binding affinities are very low. And, that all, and, and measuring these low binding affinities is, is a substantial challenge for all kinds of experiments. So very often in this case, you only have a kind of a binary information. It binds or it does not bind, but really getting a KD for these kind of uh, things is very, very tricky. So you, in, in many cases, you don't get any kind of saturated binding and, and because perfecting is difficult. And so, so it's from an experimental point of view, uh, this kind of technique is really you're hitting a kind of a, re a resolution uh, limit. Okay, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so what do we actually want to do? Yes, yeah, so we'll start from a low affinity binder and where you actually want to go is to develop this into a high affinity binder. And there are different ways how to <coughs> do it. Um, the most obvious thing is simply to take a fragment and simply grow it into a certain direction. Um, this is, of course, something where we think uh, this uh, we, we could probably tackle with a chemical uh, with, with relative binding free energy calculations, depending on the size uh, of, of the uh, group you attach here. Um, they are certainly a kind of challenges because usually these, these kind of molecules bind with a very low affinity and they behave simply differently uh, in, in, in these simulations than more mature ligands. So sometimes they even move out of the binding site and these kind of things. So we simply have to check whether to use kind of restraints or so, we will see. Um, I think also a very severe challenge is what I just mentioned is um, you have not much reliable data where you actually can benchmark your methods here. And that's a, a, a real problem. <clears throat> yeah, this, the second um, follow-up method basically is it's called fragment merging. So you have different fragments in the binding sites. Um, which are only partly overlapping, and then, of course, uh, the lo what, what you logically would do then is to combine them in the most meaningful way. And so you check for if you, there are any kind of overlapping bonds, which we call exit um, vectors. Uh, and these kind of things are probably, uh, there might be cases where, where you can do this probably with uh, um, relative free energy calculations, but I think in most cases, uh, it's not, so there we will try if we um, can tackle that uh, with absolute binding free energy calculations. Um, yeah, we'll see how this works. The same problem with experimental data is uh, we have here as well. Uh, and uh, the third, uh, it's, it's the most difficult application is sometimes if you have fragments binding in completely different parts of the binding site and there is no overlap at all. And you have the problem uh, to find some kind of linker which connects uh, the two fragments. So actually, that, this is not uh, the problem to find some kind of chemical entity which can connect the two fragments. So we have algorithms for that. That works pretty nice. Uh, but what we cannot do at the moment is then tell, telling afterwards if, uh, if, if the, the molecule which we have designed uh, still binds or, or not. And this is also something uh, where we have to try uh, can solve this problem um, with um, uh, um, um, absolute binding free energy calculations. Okay, um, uh, yeah, I'm already almost done. So um, I think uh, concerning the relative binding free energy calculations with mature ligands, uh, we are kind of well set. We are doing this for an increasing number of projects you know, on a regular basis. Um, um, but I think uh, there, this, there is no reason to, to re relax now and, and uh, um, become um, lazy, uh, because uh, in, in particular around this, 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 um, this fragment-based drug discovery scenario, there's, there are so many limitations from the experimental side, uh, and um, where you can really um, not just be complementary, but really add, uh, add a lot of value from MD simulations in general, not just from free energy calculations. Because also the kinetics is such that, that you can simulate this, this binding processes now on time scales, which, which you, uh, this is usually on, on microseconds or tens of microseconds, so you can um, really make a, a lot of a strong contribution here. Yeah, so and of course what's uh, from an industry point of view always uh, uh, important is that if it's not really that simple, then people don't use it. You know, that's, general observation so 
automation and keeping things as simple as possible uh, and uh, in the ideal case, uh, case uh, three mouse clicks uh, is that's how things should work ideally and uh, um, that's that what uh, these kind of things really make suitable then for um, everyday project work. With that, uh, I thank my three students from last year, which have all briefly done a lot of MD simulations, uh, and I would also like Bert and Vitas uh, for helping with setting up the free energy calculations. And, and thanks a lot for your attention.